is brought to you by Head Start Basketball. Hey, hoop heads. Wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. We've had their partnership manager and training specialist Jefferson Mason and marketing manager Nick Bartlett on the show in the past, and we couldn't be more excited about what they're doing for the game of basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user-friendly machines on the market and truly accelerate skill development faster than ever. Beyond efficient reps, Dr. Dish provides training expertise and versatility designed to develop complete players. The new Dr. Dish CT machine has further revolutionized basketball training with over 150 plus on-demand individual and team workouts from some of the best coaches and trainers in the game. These workouts include video instruction and combine game-like shooting drills with ball handling, conditioning, and agility drills. Along with workouts, the Dr. Dish training management system also provides stat tracking and analytics to track progress and ensure accountability. These are just a few reasons why top programs like Duke, North Carolina, Louisville, Florida, Baylor, and countless others are upgrading to Dr. Dish. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com. Follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And make sure you mention the Hoop Heads podcast to get $300 off your next Dr. Dish purchase. That's a great deal, Hoop Heads. Get out and get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. I'm super excited about the Scottsdale Blueprint because it's something that a lot of players are like, man, where was this at? You know, when I was in high school. It is the player's guide that's from mentality in terms of not having the D1 of us mindset and developing character and understanding that coaches, college coaches look at more than how high you can jump and how well you can shoot the tray ball. They look at the holistically. They look at you, which is why that's what we focus on when we develop players. Joseph Harris II is the founder of Illusion Institute Basketball based in Houston, Texas. He is a Lamar University graduate with collegiate and overseas basketball experience. Joseph is assisted at Illusion by a staff with more than 12 years of experience in basketball, recruiting, and financial aid for college. He has experience coaching players one-on-one and in a team setting from middle school to the varsity level. Joseph has a track record of consistently improving the teams and players he has worked with and strives to help each student-athlete achieve their goals. His goal is to help each student-athlete he works with make their high school varsity team ahead of schedule or play basketball at the college level. Joseph has created the Scholarship Blueprint, an online course for student-athletes to complete with the support of their parents. It serves as an excellent guide for players looking to achieve their dream of playing college basketball. Subscribe now to the Hoopheads podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, please leave us a five-star rating and review. Believe it or not, those ratings help your friends and colleagues find the show. If you really love what you're hearing, recommend the Hoopheads pod to someone and get them to join you as a part of Hoopheads Nation. Don't forget to visit our HoopHeadsPod.com website, where you can listen to every episode in our archive and get subscribed to our Hoopheads Pod newsletter. Get ready to learn from and be entertained by Joseph Harris II, creator of the Scholarship Blueprint and founder of Illusion Basketball Institute in Houston, Texas. Hello and welcome to the Hoopheads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel. And tonight we are pleased to welcome to the podcast from Illusion Institute Basketball, Joseph Harris. Joseph! Welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Jason and Mike, I appreciate you guys having me on. Um, when I was looking at all the different podcasts, and you guys stood out like a sore thumb. So I'm excited about being here. That's what we like to hear. Uh, it's always good to know that uh, there's somebody out there listening. When you're putting all the time in and doing the work that we're doing, it's nice to know that there's somebody out there that listens to it. So we really appreciate that. And uh, hopefully you're not alone as, as, as <laughs> hopefully you're not alone as an audience member. And we really appreciate you reaching out to us. And I think you're going to have a lot of good things to share with the coaches and people that are part of our audience. Uh, they're going to want to hear about some of the things that, that you have going there with illusion. So let's start out though, by talking about your basketball background and let's go back to the time when you were a kid and talk to me a little bit about how you got into the game of basketball when you were younger and what your experiences were like as a young basketball player. Well, it's it's not too stereotypical, but I was uh, in Chicago in the cold, and I used to throw. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, 
Like you have a garage, right? Oh yeah. Picture oh, yeah. a garage, right? And then you have the part between the top of the garage and the roof. That one little white, I don't know what it's called, but it goes from left to right. It's like a paneling. I don't know what it is. But I started off, I had a little volleyball type ball. I used to dribble <laughs> and I used to throw it against that one little spot to as a basketball. Like that's when I started off. Like in the very beginning, I used to go and have my jacket on and I'm dribbling, pushing the snow, snow to the side. And I used to shoot. It was basically only the backboard, but I used to be real picky. I had to hit a certain spot. So <laughs> from there, and then that's when my mom came and got me and brought me from the mean streets, as they say, <laughs> and brought me to <laughs> and brought me to a safer environment for a young man to come up. So that that's kind of the origins of me in basketball. Very cool. <laughs> that's a that, that is very interesting. I know that I have. Not a completely different experience because I did actually have a rim on my basket when I was a kid. But I did have a basement from the time I was in second grade that there was a steel beam that went below the rafters in my basement. And so basically you would have a hole between two rafters and a beam. And I used to play in my basement with my neighbors and friends. We'd come over and at that point... It was just low enough that you could maybe try to dunk it through. So you'd be slam, <laughs> slamming your wrist against this steel beam, trying to slam yeah. it through this 12 by 12 hole. And those games were, I, I don't even know if you could call them basketball. They were sort of a mix of, <laughs> of basketball and football. So uh, I can, I can relate to, I can relate to not shooting through a hoop, but actually trying to, trying to find, trying to find a spot. Uh, so what was it that you liked about basketball when you were a kid? What was it that, that made you want to go out there and throw that ball up against the, uh, you know, the side of your garage? Uh, what, what, what did you like about the game? Well, first, just uh, to the story you just said, it's, it, it never ceases to amaze me, the imagination of a child. Like, True. you were in the middle of a basement and with a metal pipe, and you might as well be at the United Center in mm-hmm. Chicago or something. So true. You know, and same, and same thing with me, uh, with shooting on the side of the uh, garage. <laughs> but when, um, what, the, what I always liked about basketball was how it's, it's a, a game of improv. It's a lot of improvisation in the game of basketball. Like, it's something that if a play falls apart, if you have the skills and the ability, you can improvise and make a change and adjust to what's happening. It's, it's a real fast paced game going back and forth, back and forth. And I've always liked that element of it. And moving forward, when I got a little older, I started playing this game called 21. And I know you and Jason are very familiar with that game. Absolutely. Where it's, it's like, you know, five or six guys or however many playing, we're playing the 21. So we used to call it. It's funny because in every in different parts of the country, that game has different yeah. names. So I was thirty three. Yes. 30, so here here in Cleveland, that's thirty three. So we used to call, oh. so we would so we would call that thirty. And you would go back. to I mean, I don't know what Mike played because Mike's a little bit older than me. It's but, the same. I'm but we sure would play. We would go. You had to get to twenty one to be safe. And then if you weren't, if you didn't get to twenty one and you got tipped, you were back to zero. So let me ask you this. Let me ask you guys this. Did you guys shoot? When you score, did you shoot from the top of the key three point line or the free throw line? Free throws, free throw line. We would shoot from the free throw line. Oh, okay, okay. Because we we would shoot uh, the top of the key three pointer. That's that's that was our free throw. It's funny, and just like we talked about the basement games getting a little physical, uh, <laughs> thirty three ended up becoming uh, at various times it it might have looked more like a football, football game, or, or, yeah. or rugby match. <laughs> we actually had I had a friend in high school who was. I don't know, he was probably two or three years older than me, and he had a guy that lived down the street from him who had a it wasn't a it wasn't a full court, it was it was probably a legitimate half court, but he had a basket on either end of it, and one of the baskets was an eight foot steel pole, steel backboard, <laughs> steel reinforced rim. And so we would go and play thirty three with an eight foot basket where you could obviously do oh, any kind, wow. of, any kind oh, of duck that oh. you wanted, so you can imagine oh, like man. how you're trying to go in and dunk on people, and do, I mean it was yeah. it was crazy as like <laughs> as like a 13 to 17 year old, 
That was oh. fun and my, probably a little think, dangerous think, as you look back. I think on my it. favorite thirty three story growing up is that there's a there's a development across the street from my you know, about from where I live. And we used to go over and they had like they had an actual like development court and actually I still play on it every once in a while in the summer, me and like ten buddies get together and we play over there. But we used to go over there all the time and we'd play thirty three and the one side of the of the court's at nine and a half feet and you know, when we were, you know, juniors and seniors in high school, like I could dunk on a ten foot hoop if I was having a really good day. I was never really I never really was known for my hops, but when we played on the nine and a half foot side I would do it real easily. Well, we were playing, and I decided that I was going to dunk in a 33 game. And when I went to dunk, I, I snapped the rim, and it broke. And I felt really, I felt like I was Shaquille O'Neal, but then I got really up, <laughs> but then I got really upset when we were never going to be able, we weren't going to be able to play anytime soon because we had to depend on the homeowners association to fix the hoop because uh, we, oh, we weren't going to be able to do it. So, so. You, you're the so. All right, now the mystery is solved. You're the reason why they started taking all the rims down. That's right. Exactly. They're all the park. Exactly. That's why, that's why <laughs> hey, hey that, that, those hoops, those those hoops still right? stand, by the way. Blame those hoops. On, blame it on Jason. Those hoops still stand. I don't know that they ever actually replaced the rim. I think they just put new bolts in because, like, I want to say four years ago when we were playing in the summer, like, it, we just, I don't think it had been used very often, and we would play on it, and uh, every, you know, we it would it would get looser and looser and then one time we were playing and we, or we showed up on a Saturday morning and the rim was literally hanging by one bolt like the other bolts had fallen <laughs> off so we had to bring our own ladders and replace it because we knew that it wasn't going to get replaced by the homeowners. But well, at least there's a court there, right, Joseph? That's that's like ninety. <laughs> there you go. That's like ninety percent of the battle today. You want to play outdoor? That's right. You want to play outdoor basketball at a playground? Good luck. Oh, good luck. Good luck. Did you know what? That that's so true. And and again, like. All you need is a couple guys to do that, or girls. Yep. You know, just need a couple players yep. to just get out there and play. And that, to me, that to go back to what you mentioned earlier, that to me is one of the best parts about basketball. Like, it is a team sport, but you can excel as an individual within the team concept if you have the proper skills and whatnot. So, Jason, he's flying through the air with the greatest of ease. Right. Boom. Right. He's making me look. Now. He's making me look bad. I was doing all this on an eight-foot rim. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I imagine, Mike, that that you were the guy they couldn't leave open because you're making all of the jumps. That's, uh, that's, mid-range that's, assassin. That's, that's, mid-range that's, assassin. That's, that's hey, true. That's true. He's, he still has a record at Kent State for three-pointers. So, yeah, I don't. I don't, oh, I don't like. To, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like but, to talk about all that. You know, Jason. So. Come on, I'm just saying. It, it is. There's. There's still. It's. It's pretty good that I graduated in '92 and I. I think I've told this story. So I still have the record for threes. So I made nine in a game there. So that, that's that's pretty good that that record still stands. But then the oddball record that I have is I have I have the record for the most steals in a game. So I probably have I think my career steal total steal total might be like fourteen, but I had eight in one game. <laughs> and I, uh, and my quote in the newspaper when the reporter asked me about that, he said, you know, did you know you set the record for most steals in a game tonight? He said, how did you do that? And my quote in the newspaper was, they just kept passing me the ball. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't attribute it to any real skill that I had or quickness or whatever. It was just one of those nights where, for some reason, the ball kept finding me. So so it is kind of nice to still have 30 years after you're gone, that you know, or almost 30 years after you're gone, that you still have you still have a couple records there. So it's kind of it's kind of fun, but. But yeah, I definitely that's, was not a high flyer. That's for sure. No question about that. That's okay. That's right. You know what? It's funny that you say that because even it's like that's something that will never, ever, ever go out of style. True. Being able to shoot the tray ball yeah. or being able to shoot from the mid range or what have you. Shooting will never go out of style. You got the high flyers jumping, elbows in the rim, and they try to get that shot together just to extend their career. So it's like, that's something that would never go out of style, being able to shoot the ball. There's no question about that. I think if you could give advice to any player, if you can shoot the ball, there's probably always going to be a spot for you. Uh, coaches are yep. always going to want somebody who can knock shots down. And if you're a kid out there, if you're a player, and you can develop the kind of shot that a coach can rely on, you're going to give yourself a, a really good opportunity to be able to, you know, to be able to play. So talk a little bit more about about your playing days. Give us an idea of just uh, where you went with the game and, and uh, 
maybe some memories from your high school career. Just just talk a little bit about what you remember from from your days as a player. Well, I'll say one of my uh, favorite memories of, as a player was my junior summer in high school, and I was selected to go uh, play in Belgium uh, at this like this tournament, and and they had some other guys. It was like kind of um, my first experience with playing with other guys that I didn't know. I mean, from a can of paint. I mean, I didn't know who they were at all. Right, so right. We, we, we all come in and then we go, uh, you know, we fly. It was the longest flight I had ever been on in my life at the time. And uh, we went and in the tournament, we ended up going to the to the championship. And though um, and I at the time I was playing, I, I was a post player because I, I'm 6'6", six, six, which, of course, you know, in college, that's average. But, in, you know, in some high schools, that's right, tall. That's, that's, so That's tall in high school. Yes, yes. And uh, so I was playing the center, and we made it – our team made it to the uh, to the championship. And it was a real close game. And speaking of shooting, there was a mic on the team. All right. that, that, that's all he did. All right, there you go. Trey Ball. All right, that's it. It. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. <laughs> I, was not, I was not in Belgium. I've never been in Belgium, so it wasn't me. Man, so, so anyway, the game got – and we were playing against this team from Poland. And they had some – I mean, it's like these tall these tall guys. All of them were tall. Was, the guy I was guarding was, like, taller than what I was. But anyway, so he uh, he goes in. He dri- I think we were down by two because I'm, I'm going to call him Mike. So Mike – Shoots the three because I forgot his name, but Mike shoots this uh, buzzer beater within the next, within the last thirty seconds. So, so anyway, like the the, the event, the uh, the course of events in the game, that big guy drove in, and you know I jumped up, ah, block it, and I ah, scream and all of that, <laughs> and then all the crowd goes ah, like that. So it's it's real heated, it's like emotional, and then people chanting in the audience and all of that. And my, my my heart is pumping a million miles a minute. So I blocked the shot. And then, because he looked surprised. You know, because a lot of times if a guy is taller, he's the tallest player on the court. Same thing on the girl's side. The tallest player, they're like the, the big wolf in the forest that nobody talks to because they just don't dare to. But really, they're just as scared as you are. So he was surprised that I, I contested him, and he was surprised by that. So I jump up, boom, block the shot. I scream, ah! And then the other guy, the point guard gets the ball. His name was Derek. Derek gets the re- uh, blood shot. Derek gets it. He passed it to Mike. Mike dribbles on the right, the right wing. He takes a couple dribbles. And he pulls up from that right wing three-pointer. Pow! Knocks it down. All net. Ah! Start going crazy. So we up by one. And then we steal the ball from them. Then we run the clock out, right? So then... Everybody runs the floor. It was like, it was, it was so awesome. Like that moment was awesome. So then everybody runs the floor like this, the Cameron crazies running in the floor. Ah! <laughs> and then everybody's jumping up and down, going crazy. Ah! And they start chanting, USA, USA. Oh, oh man. That's that awesome. Was awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. It was like, it was like you got an Olympic experience. Oh, I mean, it felt like, you know, so that, that was a, a phenomenal experience. And, uh, that's something that, and then when I came home, I got a chance to, uh, my English teacher helped me. And this is going to get into more into my why in a moment. But when I got home from that, uh, my English teacher, her name was Miss Hancock. Miss Hancock said, Hey, Joe, congratulations. I came back. I was super pumped. And she said, uh, well, um, uh, the, the newspaper wants you to write an article. I uh, just write about your experience there. So I write it, and of course, my English teacher, Ms. Hancock, is like, oh, well, let me help you with that. So I didn't know it at the time, but my tone was very negative. Like, I did it in spite of X. I did it in spite of Y. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yep. so, so, so-and-so said I couldn't do this, but I did anyway. Th- that whole vibe, right? Right, right. A little chip on your shoulder. Yes, I had a chip on my shoulder because, as I said, it's going to allude to my Y. My high school coach, I felt at the time just didn't believe in me or didn't, I guess, I don't know, promote or like 
I don't know. I can't explain it. I, I felt that that he just didn't seem to have my back the way I would assume that a, that a coach should. So, so when I wrote the when I wrote it, the first draft, Miss Hancock was like, Joe, you can't write. You can't send this to the paper because I, of course, I wasn't. I didn't. I wasn't disrespectful. I wasn't. It was just negative, like a chip on my shoulder, like you said. So then, when I did that, we did a redraft and redraft, and then, of course, we sent it to. The, uh, the, the, uh, the newspaper and then the newspaper just printed it as is and everybody read it and I put the ah in there with all with 12 exclamation points and all of that so it was like it was real fun and that that was uh, like the long version I probably went a little longer than I should have but that was one of the uh, best memories in basketball for me yeah that's very cool that you got that experience as a high school kid to be able to a travel and then come back and through that writing to be able to, I'm sure, force you to reflect on what the experience was like. And I think a lot of times, especially when we're younger, and I know I can speak for myself, that you kind of go through and you have these experiences and they're they're rich and they're they're so emotional in the moment that you don't necessarily always go back and reflect on the experiences that you have when when you're younger and I so I would suspect that for you especially when you had your English teacher be willing to help you and kind of help you to process that whole thing that that had to be able to to really get you to think about what the experience was like both from a basketball and a cultural perspective I'm sure oh absolutely well said I agree 100 percent very much so so all right let's let's lead that into you mentioned that it's kind of leading towards your why so let's think about while you're while you're still playing is there a thought that someday you'd like to stay involved in the game as a coach or was that something that came later as you started looking around and trying to figure out what you want to do with your life just talk a little bit about how coaching came to be important to you and and why you were drawn in that direction well when i found out that coaching matters it's like as i um continue to play i discovered that coaching makes a big difference and uh, uh, like the right coach can pull every ounce every ounce of potential out of a player like squeezing the bottom of that toothpaste everything and some coaches just can't right and then and then when i started to recognize the difference that's kind of what sparked it in me. Like, I want to be able to take that player that doesn't quite believe in themselves just yet and put that in them and make them feel they can fly. Even if their wings not, may not be as big as another player, but they feel, you know what, I can do this <laughs> and give them the direction. And that's the, that was, I guess, the seed that was planted. And then when I started to coach and I saw the before and after, I got addicted to the change, like from day, from game one to game 20, that change and then improvement. And that's the same thing with like skills training one on one or coaching a team. In either case, to see that before and after is what really drives me. Yeah, I love that. I love that what is important to you is the improvement and you know there's there's a lot of talk out there in basketball and in sports today about focusing on the process as opposed mm. to the result and i think that that concept has been around for a long long time uh, but it but it hasn't always been verbalized in such a simple way as saying hey we focus on the process but that's what i hear you saying is the process of helping a kid, a player, a team improve and get better is what excites you. And I, and I go along with the other thing that I hear you saying and that when we talked previous to the podcast and just knowing and seeing the things that you have going on, which we're going to talk about as we move forward here, is it's not just seeing them improve as a basketball player in terms of their ability to shoot a jump shot or execute a crossover dribble or some other fundamental basketball skill. It's also seeing them improve as people and as teammates and as 
someone whose character is getting better as a result of interacting with you as, you as a coach. So talk a little bit about why that piece of it is so important to you. Cause I think it's an, I think it's a key component to your story. You know what? That is very important to me. And I'm glad that that's, that you picked that up out of our previous conversation and what us speaking right now that it's important to me because sometimes like if you visualize a pie chart, a lot of players sometimes don't understand that basketball is just one sliver of that pie and they will base their relevance and how, and their value as a person around how well they play the game of basketball. And I think that that's something that they need to understand that basketball is only a part of you. It's just, it, it may accent your life and complement what you're doing and help you build confidence, but basketball is absolutely a tool. Now, if they're fortunate enough to play at the college level, fantastic. The pro level, fantastic. But basketball, like, like many sports, teaches life lessons that without the sport you may not learn and to me that's why the holistic approach is so valuable and priceless because when you're developing skills that's great but if you're like when you made those nine three-pointers in the game if you missed your first two if mike doesn't have the mentality the mental fortitude to push through you know what i'm gonna shoot again i might go over three but i'm gonna shoot again that's character for you to have the, the the belief in yourself, the confidence and things like that, that's something that is often overlooked in terms of development. It really is. It's like, oh, well, you know, Jason has it or he doesn't. Mike has it or he doesn't. Joseph has it or he doesn't. When that's not true, when all they may need is a little nudge and then they'll start believing or they'll start practicing the, the positive character trait that they need to work on. And sometimes it's overlooked the same way that I think it's Sometimes skills are kind of overlooked, like, oh, they kind of have it or they don't. But another reason why I really like basketball is that it is absolutely a skill sport. No question. Like you, it helps to jump high and run fast. But if you can't, if you don't have the skills such as ball handling and shooting, you're going to plateau. You can, you can only dunk on guys at a certain level. And then when everybody jumps like you, uh oh, now you got to learn how to finish with your left hand, for right, example. Exactly. Exactly. I, I think that's I think that's so true. When you just said that about, you know, athleticism being, you know, a piece that certainly is helpful, but if you don't have the skills, you can't really execute it. I think of a guy like and I'm gonna I'm gonna date myself here. I don't I don't know if Jason will see if he gets the reference, but you know, Carl Lewis was a tremendous track athlete back in the day. Mm. Uh, you know, hundred meter runner and long jumper and just you know, from a from a running and jumping standpoint was probably one of the greatest athletes of all time. And then I remember that yep. he threw out the first pitch at, I don't know if it was a World Series <laughs> game, and, and he threw the ball like into the ground, like two feet in front of him. And because he didn't have that, that was not a skill that yep. he had. And, and to your point, basketball is, is very much a skill-driven sport. And as a result, when you put the time in to work on those skills, it's something that you can, you can improve on very, very quickly if you're willing to put the time in. And I think the other side of that that you mentioned is talking about how not only are you developing their physical skills, but there are also mental skills that are involved in being a good player and able, being able to perform in a game situation. As you've listened to the Hoop Heads podcast, one common topic that continually comes up in our conversations is character. I'm fortunate to be associated with the Positive Coaching Alliance, a national nonprofit movement that provides valuable tools, training, and resources for coaches, athletes, parents, and administrators that is centered around sports and educational psychology and organizational behavior research. PCA combines this research with practical advice from a national advisory board of top pro and college athletes and coaches who utilize PCA principles at the highest levels of competition. Through a partnership with our local Cleveland chapter of the PCA, we are pleased to offer a discount code to allow you, our listeners, to take a PCA online course for just $20. To take advantage of this offer, 
Visit the store on positivecoach.org and enter the discount code HOOPHEADS20. That's HOOPHEADS20 with two capital H's. Coaches, I hope you'll take advantage of this great offer from the Positive Coaching Alliance and help us continue to grow the game. question that I wanted to ask you is, when you first started out coaching, was there, did you have the same thought process in terms of thinking about the character piece of it, the life lessons, was that part of your motivation right from the very beginning or was that something that you came to later as you really started to get into coaching? Which which one would you say better describe you? I'd say that that's something that may sound a little cheesy, but from the beginning, I was all about the character development. Like I would make, for example, I, there was a, a player that on this team I was coaching and he was an upperclassman. There was a, yeah, there was a, a upperclassman and he kind of knew the play we were working on, right? It was a play called, uh, what was it called? We called it water. Okay. So this play called, this is, it was a man play. It was against the man defense and this play called water. He, well, I won't say his name, but his, but he, he knew the play and he knew it well. And he's the point guard. And now this other guy is a couple years younger and he didn't quite grasp it yet because it was water was based on you kind of thinking for yourself. And this it's like a flowing offense. Right. So, so anyway, he says the older guy it was like, ah, oh, man, you don't know it yet. Oh, we got running again. Oh, he started doing that. Right. And so then I stopped practice. I said, no, wait, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa. You act like you were just born knowing this play like you had to learn it the same way he had to learn right so then of course you know I, you know i had to i made him run and push-ups and all of that to make him understand the value of leadership and like he will follow th- this younger this underclassman will follow you if you lead him he's gonna follow you but he's not gonna follow you if you're downgrading him for and and insulting him for not knowing the plays and whatnot so so anyway that's something that has always been important to me because I know that, you know, Father Tom is undefeated. So eventually, you're no longer going to be able to play this game of basketball. Yeah, unless but you're LeBron lesson, James. Well, yeah, <laughs> unless you're LeBron James, like, uh, like a, like, uh, I mean, a physical specimen, like uh, a LeBron Father James. Tom, Father Tom may win that game eventually, but man, LeBron is making it awful tough on Father Tom. Uh, yeah. He's he's giving Father Tom a run for his he money. Is, Him yeah. and Tom Brady, yeah, yeah, both yeah. up. Right, I agree. And I want I want, both the, I want the record to reflect that I did know who Carl Lewis was because I didn't feel like I addressed that situation. <laughs> I'm glad, I'm he was competing in Atlanta in '96, I think. Right? I feel like that was. Oh, oh yeah, that's Michael Johnson. No, I know. Yeah, I'm pretty Carl sure Lewis I'm, was not around in. in the I think he was. Olympics. No, because I'm going to fact check you. His big, his big year was was the '84. Was the '84? Well, Olympics. I'm pretty sure that he did it for oh, like you check. 15 years. Get on it right now. Okay, I'm going right, to fact Jason, check. <laughs> Jason's, Jason's getting on. Jason's getting on that tangent right away. So anyway, go ahead. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Continue with uh, continue with what you were talking about. I didn't mean to interrupt you on the father time. Uh, no, no, that's okay. Because you you you're right. Like, um, like it, it LeBron. And I'll say even, well, Tom Brady is a little different because he, his position doesn't require the physical, like the physicality that LeBron is playing. Like he's like running around and taking contact, whereas the, you know, Brady is a little bit different. But anyway, so like you're saying, I totally agree. Um, but that's something that I believe those lessons never leave you. Like the, 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 like the mental toughness, like how to handle when things don't go your way, how to work with a team, how to handle the loss graciously, how to handle the win graciously, all of these things that carry with you forever and they don't go anywhere. So to me, for example, with, with the, uh, with the young man I was just telling you about, there was a practice that is something that the next year, later in the season, matter of fact, but the next year, he would handle underclassmen totally different. So now that life lesson, when he graduates and he's gone and he he may be a supervisor. Now, instead of saying, I can't believe you don't know this policy yet. Or I can't believe you don't know how to use the Skype yet. Right. <laughs> so instead of doing that, 
instead of doing that, he's going to say he's going to do it in a way that makes him makes the, the person that he's supervising want to follow him. You know, so that's a lesson in that example. Anyway, that's a lesson that he'll car carry forever. And that's why it's important. to me. I, I want to reflect that I was correct that Carl Lewis won the gold in the long jump in 1996. He was 35 years old. He was an even better. He, Carl Lewis was an even better athlete than I thought. But he was 35 years old. He won the gold medal in the long jump. Right, now, that, you now, that, now that this is all coming together, I do remember, oh. I do remember that he, I do remember that he won, that he won the long jump, but I, 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 I wasn't, I didn't think he won it. All the way to '96, but Carl Lewis was—he was 35 years old when he won the long jump. That's pretty impressive. He was an like, incredible. He was an incredible athlete when it came to running and jumping. There's no doubt. He's one of the all-time, one of the all-time best. So, all right. So let's yes. talk a little bit. Let me ask you, um, compare and contrast doing one-on-one -on -one training slash coaching, however we want, to, we want to define it, versus coaching a team. Give me one thing about each that you really like that makes that a, an enjoyable process for you. So what do you like about coaching in a team setting? And then what do you really love about coaching in a one-on-one -on -one setting? Well, in the team setting, to see that gelling take place, to see them start to learn each other. Like I've, I, when I coach the high school players, guys or girls, because I've coached both, a lot of times coaches want to hide their players in zone, particularly the two, three. So they want to hide them and just. And then when it's time to play, man, they are as lost as a babe in the woods. That is true. They don't, that is true. They don't know ball you, man. They don't know where to go. They, they play hug me defense. They, they're like hug their person all over the place and things like that. So anyway, the basic man to man principles, they don't know. So early on, we work on man defense and they're like, Oh, coach, can we do man? I mean, can we do zone? No, we're not. No, we'll do that time to time. We'll whip it out. But to just live in the, in a particular zone, we're not doing that. So you're going to learn how to play big boy defense. That's what we're going to do today. So then we'll learn how to do that. And Mike, Jason, I know both of you can attest to this, but in the very beginning, open layups, open lanes, because no help, no nothing. They just, hey, uh, you, you can say, drive. You say you in the drive. beginning, I say at the end of the season, my man. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so it's like the way that towards the end, the, the, by the time district starts or when they, when they get a couple games behind their belt, the way they'll talk and communicate, and say, oh, I got your back. Oh, screen, pick left, pick right, et cetera, et cetera. All of that. And to see them gel and know what to do and start to understand, all right, now we learn how to play basketball. We're learning how to play now. To see that is great to see. And then when the parents are like, wow, they look totally different. Like, they would run around like, like that, uh, that, that, that old football game, which is, and then the guys are just rotating and just vibrating all over the place. They don't know where they're going. Or like chickens with their head cut off, they don't know what's going on. But later on, when they start to get it, to me, that's one of the my favorite parts about coaching in a team setting. In the terms of one on one, when the one on one training is when that light bulb goes off, when you just teach them something new. For example, where their elbow should be on a shot, or uh, learning how to keep their head up when they're dribbling, or, or maybe a particular crossover. Uh, like I like to teach, uh, I know you guys know who Tim Hardaway is and with the killer crossover oh, yeah. or the, or the UTEP two step. Right. Well, it's, before. It's, it's funny that you say that because, you know, you think about where the game has gone now in terms of how guys handle the ball and the different things that you can do with the dribble. And I, I think there's, if you go back to maybe the day when you were playing or when I was playing, you, you, a lot of the dribbling that goes on today would have been called a carry back in my day. Uh, but, yeah. but, but the killer crossover just was, was so revolutionary. And now you can look at it and I would say a lot of middle school guards have it in their arsenal. But at the time when Hardaway yeah. broke that out, it was, it was like, Oh my God, I can't believe he's you know, putting <laughs> that, putting that two combo move together. 
That's incredible. We're, we're talking about the guy who plays for the Knicks, right? Jason's <laughs> <laughs> there. He's, he's, he's not quite up on that. No, he's kidding. But, but, uh, yeah, that's, that was, that's, I mean, he was, he, it was, it was revolutionary at the time. That's a good point. Actually, you're right. That, which, you know, there can be debated, like, you know, maybe they see a little too much and one tape and and one highlights, you know, where they're doing a little too much dribbling, but you're right. The, and, you know, I don't, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but, you know, a lot of those guys, they want to do all the dribbling, but right. you back off two feet. Uh-oh. Now the world is about to end because you're not going to make this jumper. That's not mm-hmm. going to happen. So, yeah. you know, because you're dribbling all the time. But, but like, for example, with it, like you said, with it, and it was revolutionary at the time. It was something that's like, oh, man, what is this? What is this you know, so yep. is this? And that's why guys were on skates left and right. So when I was showing them a dribble move, what I like about or or uh, and helping them improve their shooting form, follow, following through and snapping your wrist and things like that. When that light bulb goes off and they see their work equate to success on the floor, like after the game is over. So they do, you know, a month's worth of skill training or whatever. And then they say, oh, this happened, this happened, this happened. Because I worked on this, 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 and it worked just like this. So that was because there was this one player that we worked on pivot foot, pivot foot. Now, this is something that's mundane and overlooked, but it's prices. It's like peanut butter and jelly. It just never really goes out of style. It's like you can go get steak and lobster, but, you know, you can always fall back on it. You got your fundamentals together. So we worked on the, uh, the pivot foot, pivot foot, pivot foot, where to have protect the ball, all the, all the other good stuff. So he goes and does it in the game. And he's super excited because the light bulb goes off because he sees, oh, that's why I was doing X. That's why. So to see that light bulb when they see, oh, did you see? I just made now, you know, for maybe for Mike, this not made this may not be a big deal, but five like they would make five jumpers in a row. I see Mike, he may be able to make fifteen in a row, but for him, for this kid, that five in a row is a big deal. Oh yeah, you know, so it's like. Like, wow, you know, I just made the five in a row because of the hard work you put in. So when they see that light bulb go off and uh, see their work translate to being successful in a team setting, that's what I like. Yeah, I love that. I love another piece that I'm going to pull out of what you just said is thinking about the basics and working out whether it's footwork or, you know, working on basic shooting form or, uh, you know, a simple dribble move, things that you can always fall by, back on, things that are, are part of, your game that before you can go and do something fancy or before you can do something that is more advanced, you need to really work on those basic things. And, you know, we've all heard the stories of Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, working on perfecting different kinds of pivots and, and footwork and, and simple things that you're looking at it going, God, these are the best players in the world and they're spending all this time working on these basic, simple things. And that's because those were the foundation for, everything they did that made us, you know, drop our jaw open and stare and be like, I can't believe he could do that. It's all still based on those basic fundamentals that they learned and continue to work on throughout their career. And I think that if you are a player who's out there listening, it's important to remember that, that you have to continue to work on those basic skills. And even the guys who are at the very highest levels of the game continue to work really, really hard on those basic things. And from a coaching standpoint, it's important to make sure that whether you're working with your team or whether you're working with an individual player one-on-one, that you don't put the cart before the horse and you make sure that every kid is working on their fundamentals day in, day out. And yeah, maybe you can add pieces to it once those fundamentals have been built. But too often, players, trainers want to get to the six dribble move as opposed to just being able to execute, dribbling the ball full speed down the floor and shooting a layup. And uh, that's something that I pulled out of what you said, is that being willing as a coach to spend time teaching and improving and working on those basics with players is really what leads to their success in games. Yes. And um, just to add and to kind of piggyback off of what you just said about having a solid foundation and for any players listening, I like to use the analogy of because everybody knows Lego blocks. And you imagine that that big green plate 
Right. That yeah. you know, in all the doctor's offices, right? <laughs> and all the kids are playing on it, right? So you got that long, and that's like grass, of course, right? So if you put all these, and uh, you stack, that's how you develop, in my opinion. Players need to develop their skills and stack them. So you put the yellow block, and then you put the red on top, then the green, and you just, okay, so now, like you said, dribble full court and do a layup. So that's bl Lego block one. Okay, so now let's dribble down court and do a reverse layup. Boom. All right, so now let's do the basic crossover between the legs from left to right. Boom. So now that's another Lego block. And you just stack each skill. But the problem is, like you said, if you put the wrong Lego block at the bottom, you can put all that fancy stuff on top if you want to, but that uh, you can go as high as you want. That little Lego tower is going to fall because the foundation is just not strong enough. No question. Because, you know, got, like guys will want to do what they see Kyrie doing. So, oh my God, Kyrie. Oh, hey, uh, uh. So, or they'll see guys that can have really great handle, right? Not knowing that he would probably do thousands of basic crossover with one hand. Boom. Boom, boom, repetitions like crazy. And then it's just you add the and you add layers to the particular crossover. And without the previous, you're not going to be able to do the the crossover to follow it. So they go between the legs. I don't know if you guys um, ever saw that clip. I always use this as an example, too, of Kenny Anderson when he was at Georgia Tech. And I think it was against the uh the the duke and he was on the right wing right and jason you may you probably be able to find this clip but if you he dribbles on the right wing right and he's dribbling with his right hand to the right then he goes behind the back to his left hand then he goes between the legs back to the right and then he goes behind the back again to his left again and makes the layup right well it's more like a mid-range jump shot kind of and of course, you got Dick Vitale. Oh, baby, Dipsy right. Dog, <laughs> Dog, and all of that. <laughs> so, you know, because that, that was in the like early '90s. Right. So, yeah. Dick, do you know who he? Dick you know Vitale, who, okay, I found it. Who was the player he did it to? Did you say? Uh, I don't know. Ooh, was it was it Hurley? It was, was Bobby it? Hurley. Bobby Hurley. Yeah, I guess you're right. Bobby Hurley. Yes. Right, we're gonna have to. So we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna have to. We're gonna have to embed this clip in the show notes. Yeah, so they can know. So That's the right. players are looking because now he does that live in the game. Now, if he doesn't do that a thousand times off the court, he's not going to do that in the game. He won't even think to do it. But, like, a lot of guys want to go straight to that clip and do, oh, Bobby Hurley, bang, 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 like that. But you can't do the basic behind the back first, right? So get the behind, do the behind the back seamlessly where you can do it, like, 40 times back and forth without – Dribbling off your heel or something, and then and then Lego block stack on top of that and go between the legs and just build from there. So that's something that you know. Since you mentioned uh, the players that are listening, all you players out there, when you see your favorite player make a shot, do a crossover, do a euro, do a sweet reverse, that it's like you do well based off of what you do when nobody's watching. If you take care of your business when no one's watching, then it looks easy when everybody's watching. That's why they see their favorite player. Like, oh, man, he looks, it makes it look easy. Well, yeah, because he did it a, th a thousand times. Yeah, I think that that's a key, key component to anyone's success. Another quote that I've been seeing a lot, and I don't know that I attribute it to any one person, but just it's just a concept that, I've seen mentioned in several different places recently is just that if you want to really be good at something, and this doesn't necessarily apply just to basketball, but you have to be willing to accept the quote boredom from mm -hmm. working on the fundamentals of whatever it is that you're trying to get better at. And so is it, is it fun and exciting to work on reverse pivots every single day as part of your basketball workout? Probably not. It's probably a lot more fun to do that Kenny Anderson move. But mm -hmm. if you can't execute a flawless reverse pivot under any type of conditions that you might see in a game, you're not going to be as effective 
of a player. And I think that's something that when you think about the way that somebody gets to be good at something, whether you think of the 10,000 hour rule or just, you know, the amount of time that you put in on something, you, at some point in that process, there's going to be boredom. And for most people, when boredom strikes, what do they do? They walk away. They're like, ah, eh, I don't want to do this anymore. But for someone who truly wants to be good at it, they're going to be able to fight through that boredom. And I think all those pieces of what we were talking about there kind of come together to, to paint the picture of you got to work on the basics. You got to work on them over and over again. And you have to be willing to do that, which is sort of the price that you pay for being able to have success when the lights are on, which is what you were talking about. Yep, I agree. I All right. agree hope. Yeah. All right, so from there, give me an idea. Let's go and talk about Illusion. Tell me why you started it, how you started it, and what exactly it is that you guys do and what the mission and vision is. Well, the, the name Illusion Institute, uh, of course, Illusion Institute Basketball Training, but Illusion Institute started, well, the name I came up with because I think basketball players are some of the best illusionists out there, uh, magicians kind of. So they make you think they're going left, but they're really going right. You make you, they think that you think that they're about to do a jumper, but they're really going to drive by you. So they are, it's like a lot of trickery. It's a uh, sleight of hand, especially when you have the skills to do so. You, like that play where Jordan goes at the middle, the dunk, and then he switches it with his left hand and finishes it when uh, Sam Perkins jumps up and then yeah. he, the Marv, uh, Albert, the, Marv, was, the Marv Albert call a spectacular move by Michael. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, another, yeah. Another one. yeah. Yeah. A spectacular move by Michael Jordan. Yes, exactly. So that that's improv. Like that's again, that goes back to what I really liked about it. You know, when I was a kid, just the fact that you can, if you have the skills, you can do that. So, so anyway, that's where illusion came from. And then Institute, of course, you know, it's, it's, it's a course of action to learn something. So, but when I started it, it really was on accident, like many businesses do. <laughs> like they kind of start, oh, right. you know what, let's try this. So my nephew came to me and was like, hey, uh, can you help me with my uh, dribbling moves? Like, I want to do some crossovers because he was a good scorer, but he, but he was where he would have been a very undersized guard, like, like uh, small forward. So he had to, at his height, he was going to have to be a point guard. Yeah, to play. Ball, right. yep, yep. He had to, it was no way around it. So he was like, Oh, oh I need to get my handles together. Cause I used to tell him, I said, Hey, I said, man, you, you got to get your handles right, man. You, you, you have to, cause you're not shooting over nobody at your height if, at the level you're trying to go. You're not going to be able to do that. So anyway, so he was like, yeah. So then we started working on it in the garage, in the garage, in the garage. And then that's when he's, and then after that, it was just for fun, you know, cause it's my nephew, you know, so it's not like, oh man, that'll be, that'll be $40. <laughs> it was nothing like that. So it was more like, yeah. And then after we finished and he saw improvements and I enjoyed watching his process, like you said earlier, the buzzword process. And they, I saw the process he went through and saw his before and after. And I was like, you know what? There's probably some other uh, athletes that need that. And then I, I got a group on. That's where it started. I, I did a group on, I made a group on nice. uh, for training sessions. And my very first group on that a parent purchased. And, you know, I'm in Houston, I'm in Houston, Houston, Texas. So I'm in the Houston area. And then when I did it, when I put that and the player bought it, he was, the dad was like, you know, you know, I, it's not a lot of people doing what you're doing. Like I was looking, you know, almost like he chose me by default. Kind right. Of. Right. <laughs> right. Understood. So, I was like, nobody else can't find anybody else. Yeah. Let's go to Joseph. There's no problem. Let's go to Joseph. Why not? He's the fallback guy. So, uh, but then, you know, uh, that's where I realized, you know what? Wow it's actually a market for this because you have the dads like you, Mike, that know basketball, but maybe you don't have the time, right, to make sure your son and or 
you got the element of, oh, my God, dad. Da, da, da. And he'll listen to a stranger before he listens to you, right. even though I never used you to, I never used to believe that until I had my own kids. People used to tell me <laughs> people used to tell me that before I had my own kids. They're like, you know, I, I try to tell him the same thing, but, he don't, you know, he just won't listen to me. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, that makes no <laughs> sense to me. And then I have my own kids and I'm like, yeah, I get it. I understand why. I'm like, they <laughs> they hear me talking to them about every single thing. They don't want to hear me talking to them about, about basketball. So. So I get I get that completely. That that is so true. Uh, it's and I never would have believed it before. I had my own kids. <laughs> yes, you know. So when it comes to that, like you wouldn't necessarily need unless you're like, hey, I want him to be comfortable being coached and trained by someone other than myself. Unless that's just something you wanted to do. Right. You have all the you have all the expertise to be able to tell them. So you have the Mike type parent that that has the expertise but maybe they don't have the time or little little mike doesn't want to listen and then on the other side of the spectrum you have the parent that means well but doesn't know how to go about helping right. little johnny be able to play like i want to be on varsity or i want to i want to shoot like so and so that i saw on tv and they're like uh i don't really know and then you got some of the ambitious dads that may maybe they maybe they Watch YouTube videos, but that doesn't mean you could translate the knowledge to them to make it to where it's understandable. But when I found out that there was a market for it, when it was kind of on accident, so it started off with my nephew, and then it started with a group on, and then the rest is history. Nice, that is, that's that's tremendous. So give people an idea of before we get into some of the stuff that kind of drew us together from talking about the scholarship blueprint and what that's all about, which we'll get to in a second. Just give people an idea who are out there of what services you provide that you have that you offer people through Illusion. Okay, so we offer a holistic approach to, and I don't want to sound like Phil Jackson or something, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like some super like yoga spiritual type approach to it but it's like a holistic in the sense of like you said earlier not just skills it's skills it's character development and it's athleticism it's like those are the three pillars that we that we work on simultaneously so whenever they start working with us they do one-on-one -on -one training it's prime definitely skill development fundamentals like no we're not doing none of the, any other crossovers that you saw on that YouTube channel, we're not doing any of those. Forget about it. We're going to start in these fundamentals, and then you can work your way up to that. So with skills and then athleticism, helping with uh, first step explosiveness, vertical leap, things like that. And then, of course, the character development element of it, of learning how to lead, learn how to handle a, handle a bad game, how to handle a good game, how to have good sportsmanship, how to be the example for your teammates and how to stand out even when you're not the best player on the team and how to handle yourself appropriately to where a college coach would be like, now nah, that's the young lady I want on my team. That's the young man I want on my team because sometimes the players don't know that coaches look at that because if you're a headache and you average a 25, they're like, okay, we'll take the guy that averages 22. Because the 25 guy, he's a headache, so we don't want to deal with him or her. So a, l a little about what we do is the holistic approach in terms of the whole player as a person and help them understand to run their own race because somebody may be further along than they are, but that doesn't mean they're better than them. That just means you have to be better than you last week. That's it. You versus yourself. Like, yeah. can you beat yourself? Like, because I always ask a lot of guys, all right, if you were like your ninth grade self, I mean, would you 7 0 skunk your seventh, like your uh, seventh, seventh grade self? Is that what would happen? Or would you just bully him because you're bigger than him? Or can you really beat him? You know what I mean? Like, it should be embarrassing. Like, oh man, look at this guy. Like, you just beat the mess out of the, the older version of yourself. If, you, if you're doing that, then you're on the right track. But if you're like doing the same type of moves uh, you haven't developed, then it's something broken, which is to me. And I may be 
jumping ahead and maybe a question you may have, but to me, it's important that the parent really sees a before and after and see improvement because in this world, and I have nothing against AAU basketball, but in this world of everybody plays tournament, 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 and neglect development of skill. And then after that select basketball season is over, they return to their high school coach looking exactly the same. Maybe they grew a little, but they still don't have a strong offhand. They still can't finish with their offhand. They still have a hard time catching and shooting, or maybe they have a hard time shooting off the dribble, and it shouldn't be that way. If you spend a whole summer working, playing, like spending playing basketball, you should come back better. So I got a little off track, but overall, that's something that we do. We have the holistic approach in terms of, like a like a factory or they're from the beginning and then they come out as a more of a polished product not just as a player but as a person as well i think it's a great way to approach things in that if and i think it's one of the the challenges that's out there from a training business standpoint is you know how do you how do you convey to parents the value that you're adding to their child as a player and as a person. And I think that what you've talked about is going about doing that is something that you have to be intentional about. And as you said, the AAU basketball world that we all live in today just encourages kids to play games, which of course we all know that no matter what the age you are as a player, everybody loves to play games and goes back to, what we talked about a few minutes ago, not everybody likes to do the boring work in the gym by themselves, working on their fundamental skills. Everybody likes to go out and play, and yet there's only, I mean, you have to play, obviously, in order to get better. The game is played by playing the game. But if I'm going to play six AAU games in a weekend, and unless I'm the point guard or the best player on my team, how much am I really getting the ball and getting an opportunity to work and get better on yep. skills with the ball? Now, there's other things I can be doing when I don't have the ball, and I think that's one area that the basketball training business probably could do a lot better job of is teaching kids how to play without the ball and teaching them to make yeah. simple moves and those kinds of things. But that's probably a whole other discussion again. But I think if we can figure out a way to make basketball training more efficient from a standpoint of really demonstrating that we're showing, we're getting people to improve, I think that's a big piece of it. The Head Start Basketball Holiday Camp for boys and girls in grades 1 through 6 will be held on December 26th and 27th. Join us for two fun days of basketball fundamentals, contests, and small-sided games. You can find more information or get registered at headstartbasketball.com. One of the things that you shared with me was your questions about how do I, how do I go about finding quality training. And so you put together a little video course the five secrets to finding quality training. One of the things that I really loved about it when I looked through it today was the questions where you had a section on what should you ask and then what should the answer be. And I just really found that to be extremely valuable because one of the things that I say a lot here on the podcast, we've talked to numerous people about this, is I think the one missing area in terms of improving the youth basketball space is – how do we educate parents about what they should be looking for in a quality program? And I think that that section of this course that you put together is tremendously valuable. So could you maybe just share, I don't know, two or three questions that you feel like parents should ask a prospective basketball trainer, a prospective basketball program? What are some things that parents should ask and what should they be looking to hear when they ask those questions? Because I really thought that that section was just, tremendously valuable again because there's just not a lot of parent education out there a lot of parents are just wandering around in this wilderness and they have no idea what they're doing where they should be and they might even be with a particular trainer or a particular group and not be happy with the experience but they just don't know how to go about changing their experience of where they are so just give us a couple questions that are a part of that course that you think are especially relevant for parents to ask when they're trying to figure out what to do with their child? Well, first, I appreciate the kind words. Um, 
Yes, um, I do think that one question that every parent, every parent should ask if, if they have their daughter or their son that said, you know what, um, you know, mom, I want to or dad, I, I want to get some training that they should always ask the trainer. What is your plan? For my son or my daughter, what, what's your plan? And if they can't provide you some comprehensive steps like, all right, first, we're going to start off with this and then we're going to do that. And then, well, can we do this? No, no, not yet. We'll get to that. But we have to start here and to lay out a framework, like a game plan, a plan of action, because uh, some trainers don't. They And I'm not trying to knock any trainer in the United States of America. No, I'm trying to I'm not trying to knock anyone. But there are some trainers that go by the seat of their pants. And then every trainer session, they may just, oh, well, today we're going to do such and such. Oh, today we're going to work on such and such. And they have no idea from session to session. From session to session, they have no idea what they're going to do. So I would say the number one question would be to ask that trainer, what is your plan for little Johnny, little Jessica? What's your plan for my son or daughter? And if they don't have something concrete to say, we're going to start off, if we're going to start off with working on shooting because of this, 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 or like if they have to explain, does that make sense? No, it, they makes, have total, to explain. it, makes, yeah, it makes total sense. That is very important. So that's the number one question. And th sometimes that'll stump, that'll stump the trainers that have no idea. They can, maybe they watched a couple of YouTube videos. And they got some cones in their book bag and right. their backpack yeah. and they yeah. come in and they lay, they lay out some cones and then they start dribbling two balls or whatever. Now, so I would say that, okay, the parents should definitely ask, what do you have? What's your plan for my son or daughter? And they, and if that answer isn't sufficient for you, find another trainer. And I would say that even if it's me, if I say, well, this is my plan for your son based off of where they are now. And they say, uh, I don't know. Now that's the difference between, oh, well, my son is LeBron. He don't need to, he doesn't need to do any of that. Right. Now that's a delusional, that's a delusional parent. That's different. That's probably someone but, you don't want as a client. Unless your unless your name is LeBron because you have a son named LeBron. That's so right. there you go. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. So if it's that, okay. But for the most part, if, if, if it's something that they don't provide a plan, that's a red, it's a red flag. And, uh, I would say, and I don't even think I put this in the video, but the, but the, uh, but the second one, uh, another good one would be, can that trainer explain the why behind whatever drill they're about to make them do? Because in my opinion, it's important that the player knows the why behind what they're doing. Okay, so why are we doing this form shooting with one hand? You know, because sometimes they do it with one hand behind the back and they're shooting with one hand. Well, why are we doing that? Or why do I have to keep my head up when I'm dribbling? Not because I said so, but why? You know what I mean? Right. How, because does, that, how does that translate to making me a better basketball player? There you go. Exactly. How does that translate to help me become a better basketball player? And the parent should say, okay, they answer that first question. Well, what's my, what's your plan for little Johnny? What's your plan for little Jessica? Oh, well, we're going to do this, 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 and this. Oh, okay, great. All right. And then they follow up with a question. Okay. So little Johnny doesn't really understand what's it about. Can you explain it to him in a way that he understands? And if the, if the, if that trainer has a hard time conveying that, that's a red flag. Because if a trainer is nothing else, they're a teacher. If a coach is nothing else, they're a teacher. And they have to be able to transfer, transfer knowledge from them to the player or the player they're training. Right. Because oftentimes, like if you were able to do X when you were playing, that does not mean you could transfer that knowledge and help a player be able to do what you did. Because for you to say, well, it's easy. Just do this. Right. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Take these two steps. So the player is like, what? I can't do that. That's why I'm here. <laughs> there's, no, there's no doubt. That's, that, that is, I think, one of the things that is 
is very prevalent that you see, which is a guy who was a player, or even I'll take it one step further, a guy who looks like he was a player at some point. Sometimes you just, by strictly by appearances alone, a parent will look at two people standing next to each other, and one guy's a 6'6 six, six athletic dude, and the other guy's a 5'6 pudgy overweight guy. And yep. the one guy, maybe uh, the 5'6 pudgy overweight guy, may be the most technically sound teacher of the game uh, anywhere. And the other guy has no idea what he's doing, but the parent is going to gravitate towards that person who looks the part. And I think that what your questions do is they allow a parent to dig deeper into what it is that that coach, trainer, program are capable of delivering. And ultimately, that's really what matters. And I think that parents so often just get caught not really knowing what they're doing. And they talk to another parent, they get an opinion from someone else who's uninformed, and before they know it, they're in a situation where they're paying a lot of money for something that they're not getting a lot of value for, or they're in a bad they're they're in a bad situation with a coach who's you know not doing the things that we would want them to do in terms of how they're treating the child or just in terms of what they're teaching, and uh, that's why I really liked what you came up with with those questions because I think it gives parents a, a roadmap for how to make better decisions when it comes to where they put their child in terms of basketball. And you know what, Mike, and, and again, I appreciate your kind words. I really do. Um, I want to say, just to add to what you said about that player that has professional experience or, you know, that, 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 that the lady that played in the WNBA for 14 years or, or whatever the case is, right? Like, in my opinion, but because I, it's players that I've trained that have no idea, like that story I told you, half of the kids that have come through Illusion Institute have no idea about that story. Right. Like, oh, yeah. And when I just told you, they had no idea about that because now they're trying to compare. No, no, no. Run your race. Run your race and be the best you can be and just be your, your, your former self. That's all you got to do. But in my opinion, when they start rattling off all of the th- all of the things they've accomplished on the court, I think that's a bit of a red flag. Now, I'm not saying that all players that have a, a terrific personal resume in terms of accolades on the basketball court that they aren't good at training. Also, I'm not saying that because there are that some that can do both. But oftentimes, like if I just met you, Mike, and I start rattling off and talk about me, 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 me. Me, me, me is dull, dull, dull in my opinion. So if I'm talking, if I'm talking about me and what I've done, I went here, I played this, this was a highlight I did. And I started talking about myself too much as a trainer, as a trainer, I started telling you, I'm trying to puff myself up and say all these different things. I think that's a red flag because now I feel like it's more, in my opinion, that is something that the parents should view as, okay, now this trainer is more about themselves than my child. It should be how, what can, what can this trainer do to help my player reach their next level? It doesn't have to be the NBA, WNBA, NCAA. It doesn't have to be any of that. It could be just going from eighth person on the bench to number six, first off the bench, or number six, first, uh, sixth man coming off the bench to being a role player or a starter or the star, whatever that next level is for them, whatever that may be. It's more important that they that the trainer knows how to help their child do it, not talk about the things that they have done. Like, I like the fact that, oh, you know, I don't like talking about that. Like, if, if you if, if I had a son, Mike, and I heard you talk about Jason talked about it more than you did. Like right. when you were at Kent State shooting in threes, that would be a green flag for me. Like, oh, my, I love this guy because he's not pushing himself. He's like, how can I help your son, Joseph? That's it. Like, it's not about what, you know, that you still have a record, which is very impressive, by the way. And I'm not saying that. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that players shouldn't do that. You know what I mean? Like, you should, you know. Ultimately, ultimately becomes about what you are as a coach, as a trainer, as opposed to what your playing career says about your ability to 
to teach the game. And I think that there's that's where sometimes the disconnect occurs. And you said it best in that being a great player doesn't qualify you to be a great coach, and it also doesn't disqualify you from being, you know, from your ability to be a great coach. And I, I think that you know you can look up and down whether it's the high school level, the AAU level, the college level, heck, the NBA level. And you can see people who had tremendous success after being a very good player. And you can see people who are very good players that turned out to be very poor coaches. And conversely, you can find coaches who have no playing resume whatsoever that are very good. And you can find coaches who have no playing resume that are not very good. It's just like, you know, it ultimately comes down to what is your ability as a coach and how do you continue to grow and improve yourself as a coach or a trainer. And that's what parents should be looking for is a person's qualifications slash ability as a coach and whether or not they played the game in the past oftentimes is irrelevant. Yes. It's, it's very much irrelevant in my opinion because it's like it's, it's a new chapter. And the ability to transfer knowledge, to me, that's most important. Agreed. And, you know, and that's something that I believe is, is very much overlooked when it comes to looking for trainers. So I actually, I'm glad that you asked me that question, to be honest, because maybe this can, maybe that can help a parent. Yeah, I agree. I think if we can help people to make better decisions about where they spend their time and who they spend their time with, I think ultimately we're making the game better or making the overall basketball experience better for people. And that's really what it's all about. So let's take it to the next thing that you have that we want to spend some time on. And that's, I think, what first sort of brought us together was the idea of being able to share the scholarship bl- blueprint. So talk to me, talk to our audience about what that's all about, why you're so excited about it. And, and then we'll talk a little bit about how if it's something that appeals to them, how they can find it and take advantage of what you've put together. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm super excited about the scholarship blueprint. <laughs> I'm like super excited because it's something that a lot of players and uh, they're like, man, where was this at? You know, when I was in high school and things like that, but it is the player's guide that's, from mentality in terms of not having the D1 of bust mindset and uh, developing character and understanding that coaches, college coaches look at more than how high you can jump and how well you can shoot the tray ball. They look at the holistically. They look at you, which is why that's what we focus on when we develop players. So it goes from mentality all the way to literally what to say to the coach in the email, like copying copy and paste an email and just, you know, maybe don't tell the college coach this, but you just change the name, like what to say, how to say it. What's the difference between a, uh, a rec- like a, a general mailer and a real recruitment letter. Right. And, and, uh, uh, what, how to become, make sure you're eligible in terms of SAT, ACT, GPA requirements, everything from beginning to end. That's what the scholarship blueprint does. And I'm super excited about it because it started off in the paper, paper form. Like I, matter of fact, you and I spoke about it (laughs) and it was uh, like a spiral book. It was kind of thick. So I was, uh, I had a select basketball team. I was uh, coaching at the time and I printed it out and I gave it to all of the, uh, the parents. Like, Oh my God, this is great. Oh, this is what you do. Oh, this is how you can contact the coaches. Oh, wow. I thought, I thought the AAU and I am, I'm coaching a select basketball team and I'm telling them that the tournaments are not the, the end all be all. They're not the answer that you think they are. And I, so I technically I could, they can say, Oh, we don't want to play anymore. You know that, but I'm, I want them to know the right way. So I'm not worried about bringing in more players. So, so I give them this paper this this i mean it's a book i can't even say it's like it was like 100 something pages so 
they they and the parents were excited about it. The players were like, oh, okay, this is how you do it. Oh, okay, all right. And it's in phases and all of this stuff. Like these are your checklist items if you are if you are a freshman. These are your checklist items to do if you're a sophomore all the way up to senior year. And I got a very good response from it. And a, a player ended up as soon as one player was like, oh yeah, they followed it and they ended up playing somewhere. So <laughs> And they started late. They they started late in the process, but they got it. And then I said, you know what? I want to see about a way to move this to the modern age because we, let, you and I, laughed about it, Mike. We said they've read a little bit, and then it's now it is officially a coaster for uh, all of the right. <laughs> for yep. all of the all of the uh, cups on the table. It's a coaster now, or it's propping up that old chair or something like that because. You know, these are high school students and, you know, they're reading every day in school and class and homework. So to read something extra, it's like pulling teeth for most of them. I won't say all of them. There are some avid readers out there. I won't you know, stereotype, but many of them will not read extra unless there's a grade attached. Because I remember one, uh, one summer I had a team and I made them read. The uh, over the summer, so it was, it was like you know, I would say, all right, every practice you got to read four pages by the next time you come. Something simple, and they were reading uh, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teens. You know, it wasn't a Seven uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. There's a Stephen Covey book, but it was his son. His son, Stephen Covey, had wrote the book, and it was so. Anyway, I had to make a run, Mike. Like. Like the whole team would have to run if two or three of them didn't read five pages. And I was like, wow, <laughs> over the summer. Wow. So you mean to tell me you can't read five pages between Wednesday's practice and Friday's practice? Woo. So anyway, with all of that being said, I'm excited because this scholarship blueprint has been transferred and into a format that I know they'll do videos. An online assessment, a print, a printable assignment, an action step assignment. So, I'm I'm very excited. I know I may have went went on a little too long on that, but I'm I'm hyped up about it because I know how much is going to help that that player that wants to play at the college level but doesn't know how to go about doing it because they maybe they don't have a dad like Mike that has been there and done that. Yeah, and I think that the Anything that's providing education for for kids is super valuable because, you know, I mean, with the Internet, there's more information available than there was when I was in high school transitioning to college. But there still is, it's almost now like there's an overload of information. And mm -hmm. I think what you've done is you've collated that into a format that a player, a parent is going to be able to tap into, go through that piece by piece, look at it, and then say, okay, if this is the goal, if this is what I want as a player, I want to be able to have the opportunity to play college basketball. I want to have the opportunity to get a scholarship. I can avoid missteps. I can take proactive steps that are going to help me to reach that goal. Now, all this being said, obviously the player has to have the requisite ability and talent yes. and all the things that we've been talking about all night throughout the podcast. But by being able to have all that in one place that they can refer to and use to help them to reach their goal, I think is invaluable. So, Joseph, we're coming close to an hour and a half here. So what I'd like to do is give you the opportunity now to share with people how they can find out more about what you do with Illusion, how they can get the scholarship blueprint, how they can find those five keys to finding quality training. Give us all that information of where people can find out about those things that you're doing, how they can interact with you and your content. And then if there's anything that we didn't touch on, that you want to leave us kind of your parting shot, you can do that as well. And then we'll jump back on and wrap up the episode. 
Okay. Well, wow. First, I, it's hard to believe it's been about an hour and a half. I know. It's crazy. It's, Doesn't it go so fast? <laughs> we, we say that almost every time we're, we're doing a show and we're like, we'll look up at the time and we say, wow, I can't believe I'm already at an hour and 15 minutes here. It's, it's incredible. So I think that speaks to the quality of the conversations that you, know, you and I have had tonight. And just We've been so fortunate to have great guests and it, it makes all the difference. So, so I agree. Yeah. Time goes fast. No question. Yes, yes. Um, so to answer your question, the parents will go to ill like sick, I L L, illbasketball.com, and they can find out more about the scholarship blueprint. Because what's going to happen is you go to illbasketball.com and then they click on online training and then it'll have clear as day. It'll say, uh, scholarship blueprint and then they enter their email address and the first name of their child and their grade. And then they're going to get a series of 10 emails. So we're not going to flood your inbox or anything like that. 10 emails kind of explaining the scholarship blueprint and uh, what it does and how it benefits the players. And I'll say that for any parent that unless you are already a college coach, a parent that's a college coach, or if you're a player that, let's say you're a six four girl in eighth grade, you don't need this. <laughs> you won't need it. <laughs> or if you are, maybe you because six four isn't tall for a boy, not in college. But if you're like six eight, or maybe you're six four, but you jump in front of the free throw line and you or you averaging thirty five, putting up tremendous numbers or something like that, you don't need this. But those players that are the diamonds in the rough, they need this because it provides a guide for them from phases, step by step by step. There's no overwhelming. Everything is spoon fed a bit at a time. The same way the email sequence comes explaining the scholarship blueprint. It's not all at one time. It's bits and pieces. So that's how they can find out about the scholarship blueprint on there. You can contest about training and things like that. I know that you guys are in Cleveland, but we may not be able to do the one-on-one -on -one training in person, but the online training platform that we have, that that's all across the world. Anyone that, that needs that. Um, for example, on the online training, there's another, uh, there's a course on there on, like you said, uh, what to look for in quality training, even if it's not with us, like because we'll turn you away. Because we're not a fit for everyone, because we kind of focus on those players that are a little more serious. Like, hey, I want to be on varsity ahead of time, or I want to play at the college level. Like, I don't want to climb the ladder, climb the ladder in high school. I don't want to be on varsity because I'm a senior, just by default. Like, I want to be on there as a sophomore, a freshman, something like that. Those type of players are the ones that we're trained. So sometimes we'll say, well, you know, we're not for you. We're just not for each other, which is okay. But they can find at illbasketball.com. They can find that course and it's free. That's free. The scholarship blueprint comes with the cost, but that, that course is free because I want every parent to know. It doesn't matter who it is. They need to know what to look for when it comes to a quality trainer and know the right questions to ask to make sure they're, they're not thousands of dollars later. A little Johnny is the same. Now he's just grown taller, but his skills are still exactly the same. That's terrible. To me, that's bad news. And then also on the online training, there's um, how to handle a bad game. There's an online course on how the player can handle a bad game. What is a bad game and what is not a bad game? So there are a plethora of items on uh, the website, the skill training, uh, select basketball. But the main thing I'm most excited about is that scholarship blueprint. It's great stuff. I think it's something that is needed out there in the basketball marketplace. So for people that are out there, if you get a chance to go and check out what Joseph's doing, I think you'll find that he's doing some great things that are going to help players, parents make good decisions about what type of basketball environment they find themselves in. And Joseph, it's been a pleasure having a chance to have you on the show. Uh, we can't thank you enough for being willing to jump on with us, share your knowledge with our audience. It's been great. And to everyone out there, we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks.
Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast, presented by Head Start Basketball. <laughs>